This episode of the Salesman Podcast is all about startup sales. Do you think that you'd be the perfect salesperson, the perfect first hire for Elon Musk and one of his new ventures? This episode will explain why you could be great or it could be the worst decision you're ever going to make. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. On today's show, we have Vinny Lynch. He is a startup selling expert. Find out more about Vinny over at vinnylynch.com, where he hosts the A to Z of startup selling course, which is highly recommended from me. We're talking about startup selling, we're talking about the world of entrepreneurship, we're talking about marketing, how you find product market fit. We talk about Sam the Salesman becoming the first sales hire within a startup organization, what they should do in the first 30 60, 90 days and beyond that. By the end of this episode, you will know whether startup sales is for you. And with all that said, let's jump straight in. Vinny, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thank you for having me, Will. You're all welcome, sir. I'm glad to have you on. And today we're going to dive into a topic which has relevance on multiple levels, whether you are, it's going to be interesting for anyone who's just in the world of sales and corporate sales, but it's going to be specifically relevant to anyone who is looking at either becoming a co-founder on the sales side of things, being one of the first sales hires in a new uh, startup organization. We're going to be talking about startup sales. So Vinny, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to make this as open-ended as I possibly can um, with, with a tiny bit of framework here of, let's imagine Sam the salesman, he's got sales experience, uh, perhaps he's got even a little bit of management experience and he wants to change. So he's going over to a startup as the first hire. So perhaps as a CEO, CTO, programmer and it's a software product whatever it is but he's the first hustler as, as we'd call it in the kind of like silicon valley startup sales terms he's the first person who's gonna take it from product idea product market fit and actually sell it into the kind of wider corporate business world so super open-ended here he gets the he gets the job first day what should he be doing <laughs> what 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 what's his what's his kind of first goal plan and what, what what does he need to achieve to make that happen? Good question, Will. Um, I'm going to take it that the founders that he's joining are, are, are from a non-sales background. So uh, in that example with Sam, I, the first thing I'll really focus on is the value from the product. So, you know, founders will talk a lot about features and you really need to focus in on the value points. And um, I get this all the time with founders that I work with where, you know, they're very feature driven and it's really it's about value. And the value that they feel is important versus the value that's important to the target market is are two often two different things. So if I was Sam, I would focus in on the messaging that surrounds that value. And it has to be delivered, be able to be delivered in one line. So it's what we do for you, how we do it is secondary. And you know, as a as a memorable point, when you first talk to people and you explain what you do for, for, for the product market and the value that you have to offer, that's far more important than how you actually achieve that value. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, in terms of, I guess, you know, the stage one, if we take it that there's been some product market fit discussions, if I was Sam, I would go back to the market, even if the founders had already spoken to the market, and I would go back and speak to the people that they had spoken to and to get a very clear perspective from a sales um, man's effort, if you like. Um, so I get very, very deep on that. And, then, and let me just jump in here, Vinny, for a second. Mm -hmm. What what does product market fit mean? Because this is this is kind of like entrepreneurship terminology, but this is super valuable for salespeople if they've got a new product just been thrown at them that they need to sell. You know, it's been added to the collection of of potentially uh, you know more strategically uh, products that have been worked over the longer term. For example, in me medical device sales, every year we'd be given a new product, not really much product information, marketing training. It'd be on, on us to go and find product market fit and find out why people cared about it. So just to explain that, I don't want to gloss over it. Explain what product market fit is and how we can how we can use that knowledge and that information as well. And so when you develop a product, uh, you want to sell it to someone. So essentially what you're trying to find is who are the group of people who see value in what you have to offer. Uh, a lot of the time, founders will have a view or a perspective as to who the target market is and the value that they have to offer. But what really, where you really win is where you go narrow and deep. So I give you an example. In, in a form of business that I ran, we had a, a software solution for the construction industry. And there was a time-saving component to it, and there was a health and safety compliance element to it. And when we were going out to get product market fit, we went and thought, we have something for the wider construction industry. But the more we spoke to people, the more we were able to narrow it down to even a subset of that industry 
which got the most value from it, who were going to buy quicker from us um, and, and who, who really got the value. And, and they would then act as, as you know, ambassadors for us through case studies and referrals, et cetera, to help us get more sales in that space. So product market fit is very much about going out and validating what you think uh, or where you think that the market is for your product. A big thing people struggle with at the start is, well, how do I get that? I have no validation. I have no credibility. Who's going to speak to me? And my advice in that scenario is adopt a market research approach and be open with people and tell them, say, look, I'm an early stage startup. I've developed a product or service. It has X, Y, Z of value. And, uh, you know, I would like to get your input as an industry expert or as a leader in the industry. Uh, I'd like to get your input to, to see if I'm on the right track. And what you end up doing there is, is, is three things, really. Number one, you're playing to the ego of the individual and everyone has an ego <laughs> to some shape or form. Sure. Um, so so you, you'd be surprised. I'd say nine times out of 10, you will get people to actually speak with you. Number two, you're developing brand awareness around what it is you're doing. And number three, they're actually a potential prospect down the line because the very last question I always ask in the, in the market product market fit research um, exercise is, if I had what you've just told me would, would be good, and how you know, and how you see that in value for you, would you be interested in buying this? Um, and it's a really good way of building. And and also the other thing, will on that is, you you get the potential to get their insight into who of their friends in the industry this could benefit also. So it's a great way to kick off a conversation. So you only get product market fit by going out and speaking to people. So, you know, there's different forms of speaking to people, but you know, surveys and different things. But to me, get out, get on the phone, make meetings, have coffees. Have, have kind of market research interviews with leaders and influencers in the industry. When we do this, speak super practically here, Vinny, are we likely to ruffle potentially a few feathers with with any marketing, whether it's technical, whether it's developers or a CEO, in that we probably are, as sales professionals, are going to have slightly less uh, rose-tinted glasses about the product? than what they do if they physically slaved away and created it. Is this something that we should be bringing to the attention of uh, other people within the, you know, the startup organization that you know, perhaps they thought a feature, a benefit, a value was going to be one thing, was the reality is something totally different from our research. Is that something that we should be um, not necessarily, we, we, obviously we should be sharing it, but is it something that we should be really excited about sharing? Definitely, because without, without that validation, so give you an example you know if you think about this founders get very precious and co-founders about what they, it has that they've developed and it's their baby so you're essentially in many ways you're you're um, if you say something bad it's almost like saying something <laughs> bad against someone's child and yeah. um, but you know as a sales professional when you come in it's going to directly impact on your ability to sell and build the sales for that business if you're not totally honest around the feedback that you're getting and just because the feedback that you're getting from one or two people uh, you know, doesn't necessarily drive a complete change in strategy. But, you know, what's important to someone at the start, uh, sorry, what's important to founders at the start might be secondary or of third importance to a potential target in the market. So you have to be completely honest. And, and in fact, culture fit wise, even when you're interviewing, you have to be completely honest and say, this is how I operate. And um, I go out there and I find you're telling me this is great. That sounds great. I'm interested. It sounds exciting. But I need to go out and validate that. Um, and even in the interview process, I actually look to speak to, in that scenario, I would look to speak to potential target market people or people that they've spoken to and to, to convince me that I'm right for, for this <laughs> business too, you know? For sure. Okay, so right, we've got our message. We've got it drilled down. This obviously takes work and this could be a whole podcast in itself. We drilled it down into a sentence. So we've got the initial bit of copy that we could perhaps send in emails, go in calls, have a, have a mini pitch and, and get in front of people. What is the next stage on from alleged product market fit? Because clearly until someone's bought it, you don't know yet. But apparent product market fit, you've got some messaging, you know you, you know it needs refining, but you've got something there that is, is grabbing people's attention when you experiment with it. What should, we be, what should we be doing next from a sales process standpoint? Should we be, for example, trying to find um, whether cold calling works better than cold emailing, or is it more basic than that? No, um, it's not. It's, it is that basic. Um, you know yourself well from your experience. Sales isn't that complicated, but a lot of the time we try and make it complicated. <laughs> so, we try our best, so don't we? We do, we do. And, and I think th there's, a, there's a big difference between trying to get it all right day one in terms of your sales process 
and 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 kind of a lot of people in the startups that I see who come in from a bigger company into a startup, they tr- they're trying to do everything day one. They're trying to eat the elephant and they're trying to get the perfect sales process. And to me, it kind of evolves as you go along. Yes, you will have an outline of what your sales process looks like. And at the very basic level, you'll start with, you know, you make contact, you gather information, you come back and make a proposal, and then you try and close the sale. So for me, at the very, very start, the, the stage before making contact or, or combined with making contact is working closely with marketing resources, which, by the way, might often just be you as well um, at the start, and, and trying everything. So you try the channels that are available to you. So you, you mix it up. So what I would do is I would do things like you try and come on a podcast with you, Will, for example, by, by really pitching something of value to the market that, that you're offering or a similar podcast. You try and get on guest blogs. Now, these are all supplementary uh, kind of uh, in addition to the direct tactics. And the direct tactics for me would be a combination of cold calling, which you're trying to make as warm as possible, uh, emailing and, and all the channels that you, you know, Facebook ads, Google ads, like you, you, you have to test, and even in something like you know Facebook ads are getting very prominent now. You'll have A, B, C examples. So you might say, well, I'll spend a hundred, hundred pounds or hundred dollars on on A, B, and C over the next week, and see which one gets the most clicks back into my site because I can track all of that now. Uh, so a combination is webinars. I would definitely do webinars, um, and I would put it out on something really interesting, which isn't necessarily about your product or service, but is aligned to your product or service because. Aside from the direct selling techniques, you're trying to build the brand and the credibility around the brand. And you at the start, when people don't know a lot about your product or service, are that credibility. So you have to be able to to show that. So same rules apply, direct tactics and indirect tactics, and work out what fits well. That's That's the message I would have. So when you say you are the brand, this really gets me excited because I'm really keen to get the audience to start building brands. Um, both online and offline. I think it's going to be a, a huge differentiator in five years down the line when you know, you're up against, you're to, whether it's startup sales or corporate sales, and you're up for tender, for example, and there's two salespeople, you know who one of them is, you've no idea who the other is. Clearly, with the commoditization of products, with the global marketplace, you're going to more than likely go with the person um, that you know, like, and trust. So I'm super hot on personal branding at the moment and trying to promote that with the audience. In startup sales, is this kind of like 10x the, the need for that? As, as you just alluded to, it's the people are buying on, or let me rephrase it. Are people buying more on the promise and the trust that they've built in with you as a startup um, kind of like pitch versus like a corporate pitch where they could buy into the brand and the company and the fact that it's been around for 20 years and it's been successful and it's unlikely to just go under next week? Is, is your personal brand more important in a startup sale than it is in a big corporate sale. If your personal brand is is known to the market already that you're serving, which is the ideal scenario, and that this is a mistake startups make, by the way, they go and hire a friend um, who doesn't have actually any context in the market. So they've essentially got a founder who's unknown with a product who's unknown with a salesperson who's unknown. So <laughs> I totally advise against that. And um, so if you're if you're known in the market, which is is who you should you know you should be hiring as a startup, you hire the person who's known in the market. And you know the old the old analogy uh, applies here. People invest in the jockey, not the horse. So in the same way as investors will often invest in a startup because they believe in the person. When it comes to getting a sales meeting, if you're someone who has a, a, a you know a set of relationships in the target market and they like you, they trust you, you're affable, you haven't screwed them over, you haven't sold them a dud before, then definitely you're going to get the opportunity to get in front of those people for a chat. And even if the timing isn't right, you get there for a chat. And you know what it's like, Will, in, like, while we all want to qualify who we're going to see to make sure we have a positive, constructive meeting, in the startups, your qualification right here are a little bit less at the start because you're essentially trying to create awareness. So your, 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 your process of that first meeting or, or what goes into that first meeting is two main objectives. Yes, it's to try and develop a connection as regards the value you offer and get them to come to the next stage with you. But it's also about creating the awareness, creating the brand, because while you might not be right fit for them right now, you could be in the future, number one, or number two, they may know someone who would benefit from what it is you're talking about. So your qualification criteria a little bit less. But yes, come back to your question, the personal brand of the salesperson is usually what gets people in the door to have those early stage conversations in, in, in that strong kind of, outbound strategy for sure so there seems like there's a bit of a paradox here between 
a startup clearly needs as much revenue thrown through it as quick as possible and as many customers to collect data from and all this good stuff. But then it's difficult to bring on loads of new customers because they don't know who the heck you are. They don't know potentially who the salesperson is that they're trying to sell to. They're being polite and having meetings. And so there's a there's a, there's a a kind of paradox of you need to have lots of meetings to drive awareness and bring in future business versus you also need to have super targeted meetings because you've got to bring in business and you've got to bring in revenue because that's clearly what's driving everyone's other than funding and things of that nature. That's what driving everyone's kind of paycheck at the end of the month. Is there a way to balance that or is there a priority of one over the other? Like initial first stage startups, perhaps they've had some kind of seed funding. Should they be focused on, you know, 80% awareness, 20% revenue, or should it be, and obviously these numbers are just being <laughs> pulled out of the air, but, or should it be 80% revenue, 20% awareness? Yeah, I'd say it's probably more, more of the latter. So it's more like the 70, 80% revenue, definitely, because, and, and how you do that is I would first start going back into the market research phase. Who did I speak to? Who gave me positive feed, feedback? I'm going to get a meeting with them. They know me. They know what we're developing. Okay, so I'll go back there on some of the new stuff. And also then the low hanging fruit of my existing relationships um, that, that I've had in my previous sales life. So I would go narrow and deep on trying to find, when we talked about that narrow market. So if you find, and, and I've been through this with a number of companies, you, you, you find the customer who really likes what you have and, and they give you the insights into really why it's so valuable. And you almost work with them on a partnership basis at the start and they always get the best price. You know, and I'm going to be controversial here, but they usually involve breaking the rules on, on most things when it comes to pricing because you need them. But more important than actually the revenue you get from them is the insight. And even more important than that is their agreement in a negotiation and a price negotiation to give you a case study. So I'll give you an example. Um, I always say to people, go narrow deep, get your first customer, be willing to give a discount to your first customer, um, but always look for something in return. So... Yes, I'm going to give you a discount, Will, for this product I'm selling you. But in return, Will, what I need from you is in two months' time, when this is implemented and you're really enjoying the value that it's giving you, I want you to do a video case study for me. Now, that's my starting point. And then you're like, oh, I'm not sure about video. Okay, a written one, right? So I, <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm not a great writer. I'll write it for you. And even if then say, I don't know if the company will give me, you know, authority to do that. Okay, will you give me a, a quote that I can use on my website? You know, something. So you're, you're, that, that's of more value to you than getting 10 grand over eight or versus eight grand in a, sale, in a sale. Because what you essentially then do is you take that case study and you just go to everyone else in that target market of that company and blast. And, and you have to get their permission to do that. But for the right type of buyer who sees themselves as progressive and doing something of adding value to their business, it's kind of a personal brand benefit to them as well to be seen to be the person who brought this into yep. the company and is a kind of a leader in the industry. So you play a little bit to the ego on that too. So, uh, you know, I hope I don't come across as being too manipulative, but that's just the reality of, of, of trying to, to win quicker in that startup world. So I go narrow deep, get your case studies, spread them around, and at the same time, continue to do more of your brand meetings. But over time, you'll reduce those because you won't need them as much. Yeah, I mean, I've got a practical example of this. Of um, I can't talk too much about it. I had to sign an NDA, but I've got a demo the day before last on they call it artificial intelligence. It's it's, it's just clever kind of machine learning rather than artificial intelligence, really. But this company, they're doing incredible stuff, and all they did was email me saying, "Hey, we want to show you this really cool stuff," and clearly that I'm not going to be spending money on it, but. I'm already talking about it on the show and people are going to be intrigued as to what it is. So they've, it's done, it served its purpose as an awareness piece already. And, um, and it wasn't a difficult pitch to me whatsoever as a kind of like a, a super early startup for them to reach out to me as an influence in obviously a tiny kind of like niche of B2B sales, but an, an influencer in that space. I was all over it looking at it. So if you had a, a case study or put it super relevant for me, if you had a case study of some kind of software that helped podcaster in the podcasters in their workflow and you know you perhaps had one or two customers i'd be all over that because i'd see it personally as perhaps even a competitive advantage that it's not an industry standard technique or process so you've got opportunity to get in at the ground floor and uh, ground floor and take advantage of it before the competitors do so that that's not a crazy difficult pitch to make as long as there's some kind of excitement around the product but Vinny, when does when does this shift from we've got some case studies we've 
built an email list with we're hammering the email list with um to get in front of people to get demos if possible or to get phone calls when does this shift from all that immediate initial startup to we need to put some kind of process in place now is it when you're looking to hire more people and scale things or do you want to be putting a process in as soon as it's possibly as soon as it's possible to put a process in place i'm a fan of science so i like process and i always take a view that 90 percent of sales is process and 10 percent well maybe 80 percent is process 10 percent is, is 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 art and a bit of emotional intelligence is the other 10 percent but it's not that complicated so i like a little bit of process but i wouldn't get hung up on the process because it, at the start when it's just you and if you're you know a professional experienced salesperson you will operate the way you operate based on how you've evolved and how you've learned and um, the exception being in terms of if you're reporting to people, it's easier for them to see some sort of process in terms of your CRM and how that's set out. But the big thing around your question and, and a big thing around the answer on that is when you've got this product market fit, which really you validate to an extent with market research, but you really validate when you get the sale, then you have to think to yourself, OK, how can I make this scalable and repeatable, particularly if it's a SaaS which, you know, sale, which would be my primary background? Um, at that stage, that's when you really invest in process because you're going to be bringing people on board. And when you're bringing people on board, you want to, um, for want of a better word, plug them into your process to give you a better chance of succeeding. And a key part of that, and this links to sales hiring, is if people understand when they join what the expectation is of them in terms of activity and in terms of how quick opportunities should move through the, 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 the stages of the process, within 30 to 60 days, you're going to know if that person is going to work out or not. And a big, a big issue for startups is they they trade off of their, their reputation of the person that they've signed or who's come to join them. And, and they believe in their their ability to want to do it. And, you know, they give them a chance. And but what they're not doing is shadowing to make sure that the value proposition is getting out correctly. They're not tracking activity. They're not having weekly sales meetings. And someone might say, well, there's only two of us. We don't have to have any weekly <laughs> sales meetings. Yes, we do. That never stops. Because execution is everything. So execution supported by a structure is how you're really going to succeed. So to, to sum up, get your validation for your product market fit through those early stage customers, the case studies. You can see the potential and you have two case studies, but their market size is 300 companies. That's when I'm getting ready to scale in terms of activity. Now, it's start with activity and then be looking to bring on the salespeople to deliver on that activity. But, you know, the first stage of the scale process is activity and you have to have uh, you know, structure uh, in, and, and, and organization, not just to be able to, to run that, but to be able to run the people within it. Amazing stuff. Well, I've got one final question on this and then we'll wrap up Vinny. And this is something that perhaps it comes, it, well, I guess it could come right at the beginning or it, as you're trying to find your product market fit or find the market for your product. And it also comes later on. And I get a bunch of questions every, every perhaps even every week about this of, I am in the UK and I've been tasked to, um, increase our reach and so now I'm going to be talking, targeting the US or I'm in the US I'm going to be targeting Ireland or Europe or wherever it is is the huge differences in in, in a product such as SaaS, SaaS, SaaS which can you know typically is, is, is relatively global in English speaking businesses anyway you know if it's accounting software most and you've got the that's probably the worst example because because <laughs> all the difference uh, in, in laws in, in between all the countries but say you've got all that embedded into it is there a huge difference in if you're in the states and used to selling to people in the us to selling to people in the uk and you know vice versa as well is that something that people need to consider and change process and change tact in their emails and their calls and their, their cadence and how aggressive they are or is it all pretty similar First of all, you have to speak their language. That's really important. So if you're speaking to people in the US and you're a UK company, you have to be speaking in the US English, even in how you communicate with the email, because the first thing is they'll start to think, OK, so the person's in the UK, the company's in the UK. I know it's a SaaS product and they can sell it online, but what kind of local proof have they got here? So these questions are starting to, you know, so they're, make, they're forming decisions based on what they've received from you, as opposed to you putting your best foot forward. And um, so I think that's really important. Um, coming back to uh, the differences. So I'm Irish. I live in Canada. I work with clients kind of UK, Ireland, Canada, the US. And when I first started my sales career, I was selling into people in Ireland and to people in the UK. We adopted the, pretty much the exact same tactics in that example. But the big difference was when you're dealing with someone in the UK, 
they were often harder to get to because you have gatekeepers. But when you got to them, you would get a definitive answer much, much quicker than you would do in Ireland. And that's probably because, you know, the Irish don't want to disappoint and we don't want to say, you know, a classic saying I would say in Ireland, people would say to you, come back to me in two weeks. It's like, that's not a next step for my sales process. <laughs> Whereas in the UK, you'd get a very more definitive yes or no. Canada is similar in that you'll actually find it easier to get access to people in Canada and you will get conversations happening actually easier, but much harder to bring through, kind of similar to Ireland, much harder to bring through to the next stage of the process. And um, in the US, it's very, it's, it's, it's delicate. I, I, I'm not a huge fan, as, as much as I talk about, you know, the ability to, to, to call and to develop sales appointments. I think because that's a low barrier to entry, it's been damaged a lot and abused over the years. Um, email works to an extent. I'd be much more of a fan of in-person spending time in the market, lining up three meetings, two conferences in your week or six meetings and travel over the UK. And that's the big, big piece of advice I would give to you. Treat it as if you're starting out again. Treat it as if you're going to get product market fit again. Treat it as if you're going out to do early stage meetings again and invest in time. This isn't something you'll say, oh, we'll try it for a month and see how it goes because you may just forget about it. It's not going to work. You have to commit to spending time in that market. Even if you're a SaaS product that's sold online, you have to go and spend time in that market. Get together with influencers or conferences, find potential early stage market research people to, to take you on board. Because again, what are you looking for? You're looking for the early stage validation, that case study that allows you to go and target the rest of the market. So tactically, I would apply the same rules in every case, which is starting again. Every new market is starting again. And in terms of how you communicate with people, make sure you speak their language. And I mean, by, you know, even the colloquialisms and the expressions they use. It might sound a little bit um, manufactured if you're if you're from England or Ireland and you're doing it in the US, but that's just how people will will better better view you if you like. And and they'll buyers have so much knowledge now. You don't need them working against you from an email they got because you didn't have the right spelling in your email. And it's little simple things like that. Yeah, I remember when um, I think it's about two months ago now. I went over to San Francisco for the Revenue Summit. Met with Tim Clark. Interviewed him. He's from Salesforce. And I don't know if I said it or I don't know if he saw I was going to say it, but he's from the UK and he now lives in full-time San Francisco. And he basically gave me a list of things not to say to all the locals there. One was like, don't call it San Fran or SF, call it San Francisco. And it basically give me all these no-nos. Of these, this is all the stuff that all the, the tourists do and everyone who's local will think you're an idiot for saying these these phrases and words. And clearly I, I didn't use any of them, so I didn't get manage to gain anyone's uh, judge anyone's reaction of, of them being like thrown out them and it's probably the same from people in the u.s maybe being like overly excited and you know being I, I, in the u.s i've got friends in the u.s and one of them always calls me bro and every time he says it i cringe because it's just a horrible like weird in the uk we might say mate or in ireland you might say your mate or friend uh, but he always says you know hey bro how's it going and again that would be a turn off if we were having a business conversation if someone said that to me so the lang language is is so key to this but final thing on this so sam sam salesman is doing cracking he's crushing it in this new sales role at the startup he's looking to break into other markets and he's looking to make his first hire should is there a competitive advantage of if you want to break into the us hiring someone in the us forgetting the conversation about opening offices and all that kind of stuff but just the that individual or can someone in the UK be just as effective selling to the US as someone who is American, uh, kind of like born and bred, who lives there? If your market is wide and you have tons of companies to go after in the market, then the lead generation work can certainly be started from the UK by someone in the UK, because it might start with a lot of people now, given the geography of the US, a lot of people will accept a Skype meeting as being the first point of contact. So it's kind of qualification process. I don't think you'll damage yourself too much in trying that because that's a good way of generating early stage interest. Ideally, you, work, you, you hire someone who's known in the market that's, you know, has got a proven track record. The, the, the plus of that is they get you access quicker. The downside of that is there's a, there's a whole bunch of consultants operating in the US off this famous black book, um, which after six, 12 months, you haven't really built anything or gained anything. Salaries are much higher, um, which is another issue. Um, and it can be harder to control. And particularly when you're bringing a, an experienced salesperson into a startup, the culture fit is so important because like it or not, they're going to have to do more than they would have been doing, you know, in terms of tasks 
So some of the stuff that marketing did, they're now going to have to do too. Because in the, in the last company, they were much bigger, whereas now it's just them on the ground in the US. So they have to have that culture fit, first of all, I would say. Um, and then you really have to shadow them. So again, treat it like, to sum up, treat it like you're hiring, Sam is hiring a new person in sales in the UK. What would he do? He'd go and shadow them for early stage meetings. Do the same. Get to know the person and really build that knowledge or try and tap into the knowledge that they have. Not to, 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 to kind of take over and move them out, but to understand if the fit is right and to understand that they can work within your sales process when it comes to activity targets. Because that's the big thing. Activity targets should be the exact same regardless of your territory. Amazing stuff. Well, with that video, I've got one final question to ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? I would have implemented a sales process with rules and a, a sales meeting, weekly sales meeting to manage that really well from, from the beginning, as opposed to a year or two into the startup. Um, so execution, a plan is one thing, execution is everything. So, uh, you know, when you, when you can see it, you can, you can dilute the mystique that comes with some salespeople because <laughs> you can just say, okay, I know you've got this brain, you've got this amazing experience and that's fantastic. So you of all people will really understand the importance of process and of other people learning from you. So let's just track you like we do everyone else. And I think that's the, that's how you really get to see early on if someone's going to be a good fit and bring value or not. Love it, love it. And I just want to point out one thing before we wrap up here, Vinny, and that is I'm at the moment seemingly banging on and on and on about why Sales Nation, the audience, should all, whether they plan on being in sales for the long term or not, they should all be focusing on building at, at least some kind of personal brand online, having some kind of niche attached to them, having some kind of content, whether it's, you know, just uh, testimonials or whatever it is. I'm not saying everyone needs to start a video podcast or a blog and all this kind of stuff, but I I'm really passionate that the audience should build some kind of brand, both online and offline. And this, you know, unintentionally, because I didn't realize this was going to crop up in the conversation, but this is just another, uh, and I appreciate you for this, this is just another opportunity where if you've got a great personal brand and you've worked in the corporate world for a while or you've worked in the startup world for a while, it gives you more opportunities, right, of, of perhaps becoming that first sales hire because people want to leverage your network and leverage your brand. And if you don't work on these things proactively, you it just it, it, it perhaps doesn't limit opportunities. But if you've got these extra pieces in place, it can it can be the difference between you getting that startup sales job versus someone else. And so the, these these kind of all these extra things layers on top of building a personal brand keep cropping up in these shows and this is something that i didn't appreciate i didn't i uh, didn't appreciate didn't think about and you brought it up perfectly and it all fits in a line so i appreciate that Vinny. and with that mate you've got a course coming out it ties in clearly with the show everything that we just talked about so tell us a little bit about that and where we can find uh, more about you as well so my website is vinnylynch.com v-i-n-n-i-e-l-y-n-c-h.com and um, i'm a sales and leadership coach i've got three main kind of product services that I, that I, I do one is part-time VP of sales or part-time sales director, which essentially is often just one hour a week sitting in on a sales execution call to help people move the dial forward and, and be that kind of objective voice on the phone. And um, so that's one example. Uh, I do a six week sales growth program with kind of in a workshop environment with people who want to extend their or pursue a, a greater kind of sales learning in their career. And the big one, which uh, I'm launching at, at the end of July is the A to Z of startup sales, which essentially comes from 10 years experience of doing um, content as well, but the content plus the doing is really what I'm bringing to the table here, as opposed to just loads of content that I, I read um, over my career. So it's it's really very much about actionable steps that people can take, very much geared towards early stage startups or people who have an idea for a startup and really with sales being the heartbeat of the startup, they don't know where to start. And I give them that kind of clarity. Amazing stuff. And can we find that at vinnielynch.com? You can. Good stuff. Well, we'll link to that. And everything else that we talked about in today's episode, in the show notes of this episode, over at salesmanpodcast.com. And without Vinny, I want to thank you for your time. I had a fascinating conversation this time around, mate. I really enjoyed it. This world of startup sales, I think, is... It, it, it's Obviously, it's cool. <laughs> I, there's no doubt about that. It's super cool at the moment to be involved in that space. And so there's a lot of the audience that are contemplating it, thinking it, and I think you've given them some real clarity of to or if it's the right fit for them and whether from both the personality and the kind of work side of things of it's clear it's not just sales it's a bit of marketing it might even be a bit of 
of finance and other things as well, a bit of management. And so hopefully that'll give them clarity and can either nudge them in the right direction or push them away from it. So that's awesome. And with that, Vinny, I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thanks, Will. Thanks for having me. Love the show.